Hey, how are you guys? Welcome to the Kevin Vani Connection Show. If you aren't bullish enough, then you're going to enjoy this talk with William Clemente III and Joe Burnett. And Joe Burnett is a researcher at Mimesis Capital, a Bitcoin Bitcoiner, and William Clemente is a sophomore finance major. He's 19 years old. I mean, both of them are very young. He's intern. He's got an internship at Bitcoin Magazine. They both write like super phenomenal articles you should definitely you know missing out you should definitely read them i put those in the show notes make sure you follow me on twitter and without further ado this is my talk with william clemente the third and joe burnett and we have a whole list of topics and questions to discuss so let's just kick it off hey william and joe how are you guys doing <laughs> welcome to the show doing good how about you yeah i'm doing good hey, i was really really excited to have this talk finally we made it uh because I thought, you know, the, the three of us or the two of you actually as guests um, are really the perfect complementary um, comprehension and knowledge, you know, which adds up. So, um, yeah, let's, you know, we, we made a list of, of topics and questions that are totally overdue, I think. And look, guys, I mean, I think there's a lot of listeners, especially my listeners, a lot of, you know, average people out there. I think we're trying to make a sense out of it. We're trying to wrap the hands around, you know, with all the macro uh, things that are going on, like to connect the dots. And maybe I thought maybe we can go, this is why, you know, I, uh, it was good that we made this list of questions. Maybe we can go from the bigger picture and also from, in my opinion, you know, what is really important um, and for the comprehension process. Like, um, you know, there's, uh, when we talk about the debt, you know, what is debt? And uh, there's this, you know, International Institute of Finance that, you know, always comes with regular reports and studies. And I think the latest re report or, or, or studies or numbers that have been published is approximately like global debt, like your official number is like $270 trillion. And, and then you have all these unfunded liabilities derivatives. Now, before we talk, you know, about hyper-Bitcoinization and what this could somehow be a factor or the, an accelerating factor into the hyper-Bitcoinization process, because I think there's different elements, even a psychological one. I think that's important to talk about. Um, yeah, why don't you, I think, I'm not sure I have this article open from one of you guys. Was it, um, yeah, hold on. I got it. It's the article. It's called, was it by William or Joe? When you run the numbers, Bitcoin will compress quadrillions. Oh, it was by William. Okay. Compress quadrillions of dollars in monetary energy. So maybe you can like zoom out a little bit for, you know, for our listeners. And what is it, what does it mean to have like, you know, two quadrillion in total, like, of global debt with unfunded liability derivatives. How is that even possible? Yeah, sure. So um, the point of that article was just to kind of illustrate, like you said, how much um, how much money and how much monetary energy is going to have to be compressed into the, the very small amount of Bitcoins that are left. I think there's about, last time I checked, a little over 2.4 million left on exchanges. And when you multiply different... Um, pools of uh, buckets of assets, for example, I think in, in the article I had broken down, I think it was real estate, uh, the fixed income market, and I it might have been sovereign debt was the other one I did, to be honest, I don't remember. But I had just basically taken the, the largest pools of assets and then just multiplied them by the current Bitcoin price. And when you do that, you realize there's like, all of them together are worth like $10 billion worth of Bitcoins, right? And so you have to compress all of the, that $10 billion of Bitcoins of, of monetary energy into the 2.4 million coins that are left. And, and so when you, when you think about that, I mean, companies and, and different, even uh, sovereign nations are going to be really just fighting over fractions of a coin, which is going to be kind of insane. The other part of that article, I just had kind of used different examples. I think the most popular one was dividing all the land in the world by the amount of Bitcoins that are left. And when you do that, you realize one Bitcoin, now granted, this is including oceans and like inhabitable land and things like that. But just to illustrate the mass, right? Like if you're to imagine this this monetary network and, you know, almost as if there you can get a piece of real estate on this, on this monetary network. When you divide that by the amount of Bitcoins that are left, 
one Bitcoin is the equivalent to about 6,000 acres of land, which that can just kind of in your mind illustrate when we get into this post uh, hyper Bitcoinization world where the whole uh, global monetary supply is, is operating through Bitcoin or Bitcoin is the monetary supply, right? Then that can kind of give you a grasp of, of what one Bitcoin would really be worth. Because right now, you know, there's a lot of people like the Winklevosses will say, you know, we're comparing Bitcoin to, to the gold uh, market capitalization, just like 500,000 roughly. Um, and the financials uh, piece of gold, which would we'll pass that around uh, 215,000, I think, somewhere around 210, 215,000, because not all of gold is used for financial reasons. But it, once we get into some of these like much bigger numbers, you know, we're talking like millions here, you know, it's going to be a lot harder for people to really wrap their head around what a Bitcoin will be worth. And so the only way that you can really do that is by kind of comparing it to these different things and, and dividing them. Uh, you know, in, in that article, uh, I think everybody's really read this article by, by Newt. And he says, you know, infinity divided by, by 21 million. I mean, that, that really is the only way that you can think of it. You just need to start dividing things by 21 million to really wrap your head around that. Joe, you want to add something to that? Because I was just thinking there will come a time we can't even, um, not only, I mean, people have a hard time imagining, you know, this exponential curvature, but um, like w there, there comes a time we can't even like calculate or measure um Bitcoin in fiat denominated currencies, you know, uh, shit coins or, <laughs> or fiat currency. So it, I think we need, this, I think this is a total different, uh, you know, a paradigm shift in thinking in, in let's just call it, you know, the, 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 the power of purchasing power, you know, the purchasing power. Oh, what would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think uh, William said it, said it uh, pretty straightforward, but I mean, I think we really, you know, we can't comprehend, you know, what a single Bitcoin can be worth. We already, we already have like, so many people will say, like, oh, fifty thousand dollars, sixty thousand dollars. Oh, that's too much. I mean, unit bias just creeps in from the beginning, and we, and that's enough to, you know, scare a lot of people away. But like William said, I mean, if it just becomes, you know, the the digital version of gold and becomes the equivalent of physical gold, I mean, that's half a million dollars right there. And then if we go and, and, and start going over, you know, M2, uh, which is like, you know, global money supply of your uh, checking account and your savings account, uh, then that's about 5 million. And so like William said, uh, there's a great video by called everything, uh, er, uh, what's it called? It's called uh, Bitcoin is everything <laughs> it is, divided by 21 million. And so that is just a fantastic video. It's, it's not too long. You can look it up on YouTube. I definitely recommend uh, anyone watching it. If they haven't seen it, go watch it. But also, uh, touching back on like the original question where you said there's that so much global debt right now, and it's all yielding you know very low single digit percentages. All that money uh, and that and that capital uh, is really kind of like looking for a place to go. I mean, over the past you know you know decades, uh, uh, they could you know it was paying much higher yield, and then also if they lowered rates. Uh, you would get some great capital appreciation on you know the debt and the credit that you that you own. Now we're now since we're at such low levels, uh, we don't. There's not really a. You shouldn't be in credit. However, there's hundreds and tr uh, trillions of dollars uh, in that. And so hopefully, uh, as we many of us expect, a lot of that will flow into Bitcoin. Gotcha. So, um, do you think? Do you think we? Let me let me just switch a little bit the gear here. Do you think uh, because you once mentioned um, you know that we could ment mentally you know prepare for eighty percent drawdown? I think that's that's a lot of people you know. You talking about in the stock market? No, no, I'm talking about the, the, the oh Bitcoin in Bitcoin. Price. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, what does it mean? What 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 do people have to prepare for? I mean, when we're talking about eighty percent drawdown. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, like thinking of, like we, obviously in Bitcoin we've had these cycles. Uh, you know we had well, most two recent ones were 2013, 2017, where the price of Bitcoin just went crazy. And obviously after that we had uh, greater than 80% drawdowns. Um, and, and, and you know 
it's kind of debatable of whether that will happen again this cycle. There's been talk of, uh, you know, Bitcoin having possibly a super cycle or possibly even hyper Bitcoinization itself. Um, I, I, I don't really know the future, obviously, uh, but I, I don't necessarily expect to have uh, another 80% drawdown. I think uh, just with all of these new, uh, like micro strategy coming in, Square coming in, all these new big players actually coming into Bitcoin and, and really actually grasping it, um, it's just, it's a totally different ball game in my opinion. And I think as far as like, uh, you know, the exchange exchanges uh, that, that support Bitcoin and, and just, you know, the overall educational content out there. I mean, I, I didn't get in until, you know, 2017, but back then it was like, I was reading the Nakamoto Institute from Pierre Richard and I was like, this makes a lot of sense, but uh, I mean, it's not really like the most trustworthy source. Like it's not the wall street journal explaining me, Oh, this is how Bitcoin works. And so now we have, you know, the Bitcoin standard and all these great resources and even hope.com, Michael Saylor, uh, it's a billion dollar publicly traded company explaining Bitcoin in a very easy to understand way. And so I think that the, the game has kind of changed and, and the bigger players are here, but I still think it's, it's extremely important that people do prepare for another 80% drawdown. If, you know, I, I don't expect that to happen, but I think that if you go out and you use your Bitcoin and leverage, you know, to the hills with it and buy more Bitcoin, that's probably not the best strategy unless you have access to, you know, public credit markets like Michael Saylor, where he can borrow a billion dollars at 0%, and doesn't have to worry about getting liquidated. Um, but yeah, that's my that's my, my thoughts on that. And yeah, while you're mentioning this, um, I mean, people or corporations or I don't know, entities like like Michael Saylor's MicroStrategy, you need to have a lot of cash flow, right, to do this kind of um, strategy, right, to pull this off, right? I mean, what is it like thirty million cap per year cash flow or something like that? Is yeah, that well, you have to make sure you you can afford the interest payments. Uh, otherwise you're gonna have to borrow more money, which obviously he could if, if something went wrong. But uh, but yeah, you, you definitely, if you're gonna borrow against anything, you gotta make sure you can afford the interest payments. Otherwise you're gonna have to default or borrow more money. So you, you definitely wanna avoid that as best as possible. Okay, so what is a contango? What the fuck is a contango? Now I know they might know, but maybe you could break it down a little bit. Uh, um, uh, maybe in, in reference to the article also. Yeah, I can do uh, this William. with William. Since yeah. I'm <laughs> Sorry, I'm mixing it up. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah, so so basically Contango is when the futures price trades above the spot price. So what people can do, or any institution uh, or anyone with capital, they can buy Bitcoin and then go out onto a futures exchange, whether it's CME, Durabit, BitMEX, whatever, and then deposit that Bitcoin as collateral and then sell the June futures contract quarterly uh, and wait for the spread to to, to converge. Um, so for example, right now, Bitcoin may be trading to make it easy at $60,000. The June futures contract is probably trading at $65,000. I don't know the exact numbers, but something, something like that. And so, Right now, annualize that uh, percentage, that spread uh, is over 25%, which is obviously unheard of in traditional markets when you're able to capture a spread like that uh, without basically much risk. Because as long as the exchange uh, can handle the coins correctly, there's no risk, no matter what the price of Bitcoin does. And so there's this really interesting dynamic where people can actually go out and buy Bitcoin and perform this arbitrage trade. And the very process of doing that sucks up more Bitcoins off the market and could potentially, you know, accelerate, you know, the, the, the fire that is Bitcoin. Okay. Um, William, you you just, I think it was an hour ago, you put, you tweeted and I think I retweeted it or something where you said like, and the amount of, what was that? Like over 400,000 Bitcoin were pulled off the exchanges or something like that. Uh, for, no, from GPT, uh, from GPTC. What, was that GPTC or something like that? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. So I was just basically just trying to uh, emphasize the uh, the whole supply shock going on. I was just taking the amount of coins that have been moved off exchanges over the last year, and then just I had subtracted the amount of coins that had moved from miners to exchanges, which is insinuating that they're moving them onto the exchanges to sell them. So it's just illustrating that. Um, let me see, I think it was like, 
I don't have it in front of me. It was like it was like four and a half times, I think, when you do the math, more coins moved off exchanges than moved on by miners. Um, so that's what that was. I just wanted to touch back on something Joe was saying. So I think there's there's two important aspects of of the whole contango trade, right? Um, the first one is which what Joe had said is the fact that it's almost like a second supply having where it's accelerating the rate of supply, which you know just based off of basic supply demand dynamics is is going to make the price go up, um, especially towards the end of the year, right? Because we have like Michael Saylor's conference that he had earlier this year. I think a lot of the institutional demand really won't show up towards the end of the year because it takes about, I don't know the exact numbers, but it takes several months from for a corporation to go from, hey, we're going to do this to actually making that buy on the exchange, right? And so I think we really won't see the full effect of, of the institutional demand till later this year. And so the fact that you have these coins continually being pulled off exchanges is that's going to be met with this huge wave of demand later this year. Um, but but the other the other thing that's important about Contango is the fact that like what Joe was saying, the fixed income rates right now, like uh, the ten year I think is trading right around like one and a half percent. When you, when you value a stock or anything, you use what's called what's called a uh, a risk free rate or a discount rate. And so right now you're using that that ten year usually um, the ten year Treasury bond, the U S bond as your uh, as your discount rate, right? And so Right now, stocks, I think the average S&P 500 is right around 33 or 34. And so when you do the math, um, it's actually not, it's, it's overvalued in relative terms, but when you are using that discount rate, you're still getting a risk premium on, on the equity over, over the fixed income uh, return for, the, for that tenure. But where this gets crazy is, like Joe was saying, some of these, some of these, uh, "Quote unquote Bitcoin risk-free yields are you know annualized out to like 20, 30 percent, like crazy stuff, right? And if if investors as a whole begin to recognize this new um, Bitcoin risk-free rate as as their discount rate when they're making economic calculation, um, that that's going to cause a dramatic repricing of of equities and and other assets. Um, we may not see that this year. Um, it it kind of depends on on how far we see you know Bitcoin adoption going and, and how much capital is flowing into this trade and um, but but eventually I, I do see that because you can think of it as there's like the Bitcoin pond right and then you have the giant fiat ocean the the, the fixed income ocean and there's the delta in between those two things and so as more capital is flowing into Bitcoin that delta is getting wider and wider and wider and so that's the one way that I've kind of analogized it in my head um, but I'm sure Joe can expand on this but that's what essentially is going on is is for me the the big thing is that you're going to see this dramatic repricing of equities in, in combination with this second supply having event, which are both things are both very important for Bitcoin adoption. Yeah, definitely. Just going off that, you know, the idea of there's basically a new discount rate that we can use to value assets. And, and, the, and the yield right now is, is, 25%. Even if, even if you do account for the custodian risk, it's definitely nothing like the, you know, 0%, uh, you know, 30 day uh, treasury that, that you could buy. And so th this is like a, a, a completely like new dynamic. And obviously a lot of people have still yet to catch on a lot of capital is still yet to catch on, but it, the open interest on these Bitcoin futures and the Bitcoin futures market as a whole is, is pushing like $22 billion. So this is, it's not, it's not a, uh, very tiny uh, market it is growing extremely fast and so as William was talk, trying to talk about how, how equities are basically and even you know traditional fixed income are just drastically overvalued um, and to me I, I don't necessarily see uh, those the fixed income markets blowing up or uh, the equity markets blowing up in nominal terms but I do see them blowing up in real terms I think I think if, if if we see, uh, uh, you know, the 10 year continue to rise, I think right now it's about 1.7%. If it keeps going up and up and up, the Fed is gonna have to step in and do some sort of yield cur curve control, which is practically uh, endless quantitative easing, which is basically endless money printing. And, and so they're gonna, they're gonna do whatever it takes to, to cap the yields uh, to make sure 
uh, co corporations and governments can continue to borrow at unprecedented rates. Um, and so, so they're going to keep the money printer going. And that means nominal prices may not fall. In fact, they they may continue to go up pretty fast. But I think that at the end of the day, like the best trade is Bitcoin, you know, the world's hardest money because of its unique properties that we have just not seen, you know, in the history of money. And that's why it's up, you know, a billion percent over the last decade. It's, it's truly uh, incredible to watch. And it's, it's, it seems like a great uh, time to be alive. I think just yeah. one other thing to go off of Joe's and just the fact that the reason that the rates are so low is because they're manipulated, right? And so these Bitcoin rates, they're what it really comes down to is that this is this new, this free and open market that's completely not um, unmanipulated. And, and you're looking at that, the rates in this free and open market compared to this highly manipulated market by the Fed where they're just coming in and have just continued to uh, buy these fixed income instruments because you, you can think of it this way, like, because this is how I really wrap my head around it. The the asset prices are inversely correlated to the yield. So as the yield prices, the yield is going down, which means that the bond is getting bought up. So as the bond gets bought bought up, the yields go down. And as the bonds sell off, the yields go up. So asset prices are inversely correlated to the yield. So as as the Fed comes in and keeps buying up the yield, I mean, I mean they're printing money, and then buying up the yield to drive that yield down and pin it down. Then, then asset prices are going to continue to go up. But where we're at now is that they've manipulated it all the way almost to zero. So there really isn't much room left for them to manipulate. And so that's where that's where it's going to get really interesting because you have that dynamic in in uh, side by side with what's going on with these Bitcoin uh, free and open market risk free rates. And so I think. Joe, Joe's article was really good. I had done one like a month and a half ago, but Joe really went deep into it. So anybody listening, I would suggest to check it out. It's on uh, Bitcoin Magazine. But what it really comes down to is the fact that investors, the second that they realize, oh my God, like this is the real free and open market risk-free rate that I need to be using for, for evaluating things, that, that's going to be a crazy... Because the thing is like, not a lot of not a lot of people. I, I I just don't think they realize how manipulated it is, and like how how the cost of capital is just it's just all BS. <laughs> and the moment that they have this moment of, of reckoning and this light bulb moment is going to be is it's going to be wild, dude. Is that is that like a yeah, blind spot or is that a lack of comprehension? This is what ba what somehow baffles me. It's like. How come, you know, we're going to talk about, you know, the Wall Street guys and why are they not, you know, waking up and like saying, you know, out of whatever, out of uh, greed, you know, just let's just front run everybody else, you know, all other institutes. This is what baffles me. Why are, you know, other institutions not, 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 not into Bitcoin already? This is uh, something that I cannot really understand, you know? Yeah. So this is one of my favorite questions. It's it's something that kind of held me back originally when I first discovered Bitcoin. Like I was talking about earlier when I first heard about it back in 2017, you know, I read the Nakamoto Institute, not the most trustworthy source, like, but obviously Pierre Richard, great guy, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's not, there was no Wall Street Journal. And so I, I was curious as to, you know, I, I mean, I've always made great grades. I'm in graduate school and I, I, I so I'm, I'm hopefully a, considered a pretty smart guy typically. Uh, but still, I was like, so how, how could I have figured this out? I'm young. How could I have figured this out before, you know, elites on Wall Street or the politicians or, or the central banks or whoever? And there was this great article published by uh, Croesus. Uh, you can look up, him up on Twitter. His name's Croesus underscore BTC. And he wrote this article titled, Why the Yuppie Elite Dismiss Bitcoin. And, and, and he's an anonymous guy. I've, I've talked to him a few times. Great, really great guy. And he went to a top business school uh, in the U.S., so he knows many of the people in, you know, consulting, investment banking, and private equity. And when he was going through business school, and even today, all of his peers were either very resistant to Bitcoin or hesitant to even, you know, look in, look deep into it. And he, in the article, he has this uh, IQ bell curve where he basically, it's easier to visualize, but I'll try to describe it. There's basically bell curve of people that were, you know, less than uh, 80 IQ, and they would be like, oh, Bitcoin's good, number go up, very simple. 
and then they would have you know the 120 plus uh, people who say, oh, Bitcoin's good, number go up, obviously, but because it's the world's best monetary good because of its unique, unique properties. But then you know the 95 percent of people in the middle are saying, oh man, it's a bubble, it's a Ponzi, and because th that's kind of what it looks like uh, at first if you haven't you know taken a deeper dive. And so there's there's kind of like this breakdown between uh, in the article it refers to Bitcoin maximalism, which is like maybe the more smarter Bitcoiners that have understood why the number keeps going up, and then there's also Bitcoin moonism, which is you know the people that just see number go up and say, oh, I'll, I'll buy it, um, and 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 both uh, kind of come to Bitcoin you know from a different perspective. Uh, but then there's also there's very smart people that you know can't see Bitcoin like we're talking about the people on Wall Street. Uh, politicians, great CEOs that are very smart people. And, and, and basically, uh, it, it stems from like an even deeper uh, divide. And it's basically uh, the degree to which people have trust in the system. And so Bitcoiners are more inclined to, you know, be creative, free thinking and open minded, while like your typical, you know, yuppie elite uh, MBA types who are, are very smart, very intelligent, uh, but they're also like very obedient, you know, they have a path that they want to go down, uh, whether it's, you know, investment banking, consulting, then they exit the private equity or venture capital. And it's kind of like very organized and, and they have, you know, you know, the president, the politicians, the, the CEOs to all look up to their professors at universities. And they all think that, uh, that, you know, the world is set up this way. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm educated, I'm professional, I'm smart, I'm a great team player, I'm polite, I'm likable, I can be a good social Foot, foot soldier and, you know, uh, uh, you know, sacrifice for my employer and do all this stuff. And they have that mindset to where they could just be obedient to the system and be very well rewarded for it. And so they're kind of uh, closed minded to this new, you know, Bitcoin thing that was just came out in 2008, 2009. Uh, they don't, they think they're people, they think they are the people in the know. And they think that the Bitcoiners are people just not in the know. And so it's a, very uh, interesting dynamic, and I highly encourage anyone, uh, if they haven't read that article, to go out and read it. Could there be any other reasons? Um, because I was thinking, you know, could it be because, I mean, when we were talking about like yuppie elite or, you know, the elite uh, families, I was, maybe it's just, you know, a, a stupid uh, theory from, you know, there was this thinking about is like, you know, we have the central banks and the central banks are owned by you know, we don't know, actually, do we know, uh, are they owned by, you know, for example, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, you know, like all these huge institutions and, you know, and I don't want to call it like, um, um, uh, you know, I mean, there's like family connections and it would be somehow, you know, they would cut into their own flesh if they started like going into bit the, you know, the Bitcoin rabbit hole would, is that like a, cr a credible theory or do you think that's, doesn't have anything to do with that. I mean, I think they're they're probably pretty comfortable. Uh, I mean, there's like when things are working for you, you're not going to go out and try to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and, and you know, these people, they, like I said, they they kind of have their path set out. They have they have their mindset, their goal, and it's 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 very clear. And it's you know, Wall Street it's kind of been the same for decades and decades. It, it kind of just works the way it works. And so there's no need to go out there and, and try to find, uh, you know, Bitcoin or, or, or another alternative or to even look into what it could be. As far as like, you know, uh, I guess like the elites necessarily controlling the world. I don't know if I, I, I quite uh, agree with that, but it is true. Like we, we the Federal Reserve does have shareholders and, and it does pay a dividend to those shareholders. You can go look it up on their website. Um, but uh, I, I, don't, I think I think generally the people at the Federal Reserve, they, they have good intentions. I just don't think that they're the best intentions or their strategy to help the world is not, uh, you know, the way I would go about doing it. I think as well, they're, they're kind of at the point where they really don't have a choice other than to continually uh, print money. And, it, you know, it's kind of paradoxical that whenever they come out with these stimulus checks, they say, oh, yeah, we're going to help the lower class. But in reality, what they're doing is they're destroying the life savings of any lower class person who typically, you know, don't have assets, right? And the only people that are benefiting when they print more money are the people who own assets, particularly uh, scarce assets. And, and 
so you can look at the Fed and a lot of Bitcoin and say, oh, you know, the Fed is so bad. And, you know, in reality, they really I don't think they're terrible people with like these evil intentions. You know, they just don't have a choice. It, the Where we are in the monetary policy, it, it's kind of it's the it's rooted like 80 years back. Like we're at the end of this long term debt cycle. And, and they're all they're back against the wall and they really don't have any of their tools at this point to utilize. You know, we talked about like the interest rates down at zero. They really can't do anything else other than print money at this point. And so like Bitcoiners always give them a hard time. But I don't think the people at the Fed are saying, oh, yeah, let's conspire against everybody. It's just they, they don't have any other tools and, and they're using it, it's like it's like the whole. I don't know if you guys have read uh, Jeff Booth's uh, The Price of Tomorrow, but yeah, it's, it's the excellent. section he talks about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Great book. And it's like the section he's talking about Netflix. And then you have Blockbuster continually to put candy shelves in in the store when when Netflix is coming in like that. I think that's kind of where we're at. Like you have Bitcoin coming in and it's the same concept as Netflix. Like their their network effect is growing exponentially. And at the same time, you have the Fed just continually doing these these uh, these things like the monetary policy policy. Th that have been like the traditional way to solve things, but it, it's not going to really do like they just have to continually do the same thing because they have no other tools. And the only tool left is to print money. So. And they have no other incentives. I mean, when we talk about like the Cantillion effect, I mean, do you think they are aware of, you know, the, the benefit, the privilege they have through the Cantillion effect? Because, you know, and then there are, of course, the the, the consequences, whether, they, you know, the, it's the immediate consequence or the second, third uh, order effects of systemic theft. Uh, you know, you, you would just, you know, now... Uh, saying a couple of times, like, you know, they can't do anything else than print money, you know, and, and out of thin air. And then, uh, but the, but the consequences are just, it's theft. It, it's, I mean, you can't, I don't know how to describe it else. Um, but it is a, it is a form of systemic theft. Do you, do you, do you think they are aware of that, of that? I think the incentive structure that that's set up in the U S government is that th this guy needs to kick down the road, kick the can down the road so that he doesn't get pinned as the guy who everything went to shit while he was in charge right and so they're not really thinking about the way long-term effects like i'm sure that they understand like they're they're not stupid like these people have been in finance their whole lives they understand the effects of things but <laughs> they don't want to get pinned <laughs> um as the person where where everything went to crap while they were in charge so i think jerome powell is just kind of at this point just kicking the can down the road because but he just it, it's inevitable what's going to happen yeah but william you know like people like jerome powell like chairman or whatever these are just you know they come and go these are just you know figures they come and go it's transitional it's just uh technocrats bureaucrats but what i'm talking about is like you know the owners to control the shareholders they must, I mean, you know, we are talking about the Holy Grail. I mean, this is the control of money. <laughs> and once this goes away, we have a totally new, you know, uh, shift in our transformation in, in, in human civilization, probably for the first time. Uh, would you agree with that? You bring up an interesting point, you know, um, like if you go back to the 1500s, if a government wanted to start a war, they had to go to the people who had gold, Right. And, and they couldn't just say, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna go to war right now." They can just finance it with money printing. But if we are in this new age where Bitcoin comes about and the people have control of the money, the government's gonna have a lot less influence and control over things because they don't have the money. So, I mean, you bring up a good point. I just, I, I don't know. I'm not. I don't like to draw conclusions where there isn't like hard evidence of something. I mean, there very well could be people that they have bad, these bad intentions where they're trying to keep control, at least subconsciously trying to do so. But um, never, nevertheless, you know, when Bitcoin, I say when, because I feel like it's personally inevitable, but when Bitcoin takes over, you're going to see this dramatic shift from, from power and control from the government because they don't have the money anymore, like you said. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, let's go to the next topic. Let's talk about, uh, because there's been discussion, you know, on um, a lot of press and page, you know, but some things I think need to be bro broken down. Can you guys elaborate a little bit on the bond market? Uh, what is it? hundred trillion to 120 trillion. I don't know, you know, the exact amount. 
like how and what process could that, you know, could that implode or could it be sucked into into Bitcoin eventually, gradual and suddenly? So, yeah, but like, like I, I was talking about earlier, interest rates are at such low historic levels. And people that have their money in, in these types of bonds uh, don't really have much upside and they have uh, a ton of downside. So it's a very asymmetric return for them to the downside, which is obviously the exact opposite of Bitcoin. And so I, I think it, it is it is possible that you know there is somewhat of a panic uh, out out of bonds. And, and really, if I, I saw this the other day, I think the Federal Reserve owns twenty percent of all treasuries, and that's kind of been normalized uh, in, in finance and, and you know economics. And so that is that is something that's been interesting, and that percentage will continue to you know escalate one thing that that, that would really uh or set off uh you know the bond market would be just massive inflation and i don't know if that's necessarily going to happen i th i think with you know the mmt type uh political and economic policies that are currently being put in place uh you know the three trillion dollar two trillion dollar infrastructure bill that's going to be passed uh, the countless stimulus checks are coming out in the u.s even, you know, possibly like recurring stimulus checks that may be added into this infrastructure bill. I mean, th that type of uh, money printing where the treasury is issuing treasury bonds and the Fed is buying them, and then that money is going directly to, you know, people, uh, either America or Europe or wherever, uh, that could actually cause, you know, CPI inflation. And I think we, we, we may kind of be already seeing something like that with like the price of lumber going 3x the price of bitcoin just going crazy and and at the same time uh this that this inflation uh could could be sparking the fed will have to do yield curve control which you know will put a cap on bond yields uh to make sure that all these corporations and you know, the u.s government and other foreign governments uh can continue to you know finance themselves and pay all these stimulus checks and so the, the credit market is kind of getting squeezed. And to me, the only play is Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, it, when you have irresponsible central banks and irresponsible governments, you, you need this, this hard cap uh, digital currency. And, and that's Bitcoin's the solution to this. Yeah, and I think he brings up a great point there at the end. Um, you know, it's kind of just, it's human nature to debase the currency. If you just look at any any empire that's, I mean, even if you look at like Rome or all the way back in whatever it was, whatever BC, you know, they, they debased their currency as well. And that led to the collapse of their empire. And so I think where Bitcoin is such a revolutionary concept is the fact that you're, uh, as Joe said, you're, re you're removing the human from that monetary policy, right? And, and so when you do that, um, you, you remove the, the ability for for uh, people to, because inflation is essentially a, a hidden tax, right? And so you're you're removing that, and you're you're incentivizing saving again for people to put aside money, because right now we have this incentive structure, basically, basically where the, the government's lighting a fire under your ass and saying, hey, you need to spend, 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 because if you don't, then the money's going to be worth less, right? And then if we start seeing negative rates, then it's basically going to make more sense for you to just shove the money under a mattress than, than to put it into some kind of savings account, right? And and so that's where Bitcoin, to me, is is one of the most important um, inventions, you could say, ever, because it's it's removing that, that human aspect from the monetary policy. Aren't you guys a little bit surprised? I've been thinking today, like, um, you know, there's always this this comparison, like how many millionaires are in the world, like 47 or some like 47 million millionaires. And I think billionaires, there are approximately 2,500 billionaires. Like, don't quote me on that. Um, and, you know, if you break this down, like how much, like what, what kind of fraction of a Bitcoin would that, you know, would, 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 would be, could be allocated to each millionaire? And now coming back, you know, to, to that first thing, which I mentioned, like, like the psychological factor is, um, this is what surprises me a little bit is why isn't there like a, a real FOMO kicking in it in, in, in special segments of the population, wherever they are, whether, you know, Western world, it just, you know, let's just say in the, somewhere in the, in the uh, somewhere in the segments of the middle class, 
is is that something that that makes you a little bit wonder? I'm going to let Joe take this question, but I just wanted to say, so I put out a tweet the other day and actually did the math and it's 0 0.05. <laughs> uh, so there's 46.8 millionaires left. It's so early. <laughs> Not left, but there are 46.8 millionaires in the world right now, right? And so when you divide that by the amount of Bitcoins, there's 0 0.05 Bitcoin per millionaire. And the interesting thing about that number is that the amount of millionaires are going to continue to go up as they continue to inflate the currency. So you're going to see that 46.8 million uh, number go up while the amount of Bitcoin on exchanges goes down. So as we go on, you'll continually see less and less fractions of a coin per millionaire. So I just think that's interesting, but I'll let Joe take it from there. Yeah, that's a great point. There's a great website uh, called bitcoinsperperson.com, I believe. And it basically breaks down how many, if you divide you know, the number of people uh, in the world by the number of Bitcoins, uh, there's just not that many Bitcoins. I think it's like 0.00, .00 two bitcoins per person and that's if it's all equally distributed and like william has talked about like 18 million bitcoin have already been mined and so there's there's only you know three million less less than that and so it's just so scarce as far as like why there's uh not a panic honestly i, I kind of would say there there is somewhat of a panic i mean we the price of bitcoin you know went from in march 2020 last year it, it touched you know the three thousands now we're at uh, approaching 60,000. So like that, that's not the type of return you're going to get buying the S&P 500. I, I remember like that's kind of what got me hooked in 2017 and it made me dive deeper down the rabbit hole. And so so, so I think there is somewhat of a panic. Uh, however, I do, I do think like we haven't seen like crazy inflation, especially like in the U.S. and parts of Europe. Like, it's kind of been still pretty low. So no one's really too worried about, you know, massive money printing. But if we do keep doing these stimulus checks, we do keep the UBI up and it's all funded via, you know, endless quantitative easing, then yeah, like there might be a panic and, and you definitely need to own some Bitcoin. That's what I, I, I tell people, they're like, Joe, it's Bitcoin's gone up so much. Like, should I buy now or like, should I wait? And I'm like, I, I mean, if you own zero Bitcoin, like there's no price I wouldn't buy to have some. It's so important that you just have a little bit just just in case, like, you know, the central banks and governments uh, don't stop what they're doing. Yeah, I was talking yesterday to my girlfriend's uh, brother. Um, I turned, you know, a lot of people into Bitcoiners by now. But the thing I think the people have a hard time to grasp is like, because he was like looking, you know, showing, uh, for, showing me some boats, you know, that he would want to buy used or charter them or whatever. And so why did you just wait a few years? You could probably buy, you know, for a fraction of a Bitcoin, a whole yacht, you know, in whatever, in five or 10 years or something like that. Do you think people have a hard time like thinking in, in purchasing power sometimes? As far as like just normal people that are not into Bitcoin or everybody? Yeah, pretty much everybody. Yeah. Is that something yeah. like people, the brain is not wired for that, you know? I mean, I would say like the way money works today. And if you read, you know, the Bitcoin standard, it's, it's about time preference. And with our money today constantly being devalued, people have a very difficult time, you know, thinking for the future. And I mean, like that's, Obviously, William and I are pretty young. Like it's reflected in our music, it's reflected in art, it's reflected in like everything we we do as a society. And, and people are kind of like pushed to the edge to consume now, take on short term pleasure, and not actually think, you know, for the future. And I think that with a new uh, foundation, new monetary foundation, which is which you know actually incentivizes you to lower your time preference and actually like think about the future, then people will be more conscious of, oh, this Bitcoin can purchase this yacht or, you know, just this house or whatever you want to fund in the future. I think that's going to be so uh, important for society going forward. And I do definitely do think that in the world today, people are very uh, short-term minded and, and want to think for the future. I think part of it is because the money is broken. Yeah, and, and not only, you know, not only the, the financial aspect of it, but also, just as an example, like in my own personal life, since I've been gone into Bitcoin, I realized, you know, in, in five, 10 years, what this thing's going to be worth. It's changed other aspects of my life as well. Like I've, I've started to take care of myself more and you, you start to plan for the future more, not just financially, but as far as like what your goals are and all these different things you want to do. So it, 
and and that's the societal aspect of it where yeah it'll it'll uh, increase a lot of people's spending power between now and hyper bitcoinization but it's also going to change the entire incentive structure of, of what society looks like because like joe said people are not going to be thinking about what's going to benefit them here and now in the next week they're going to be thinking about oh over the five ten year time frame you know how can i build a better life for myself over time what things do i need to do to put myself in a position to enjoy that right because like if if i think bitcoin's going to go up to whatever you know in the next 10 15 years i want to be able to enjoy that spending power appreciation so i'm going to take care of my body and and my mind so that i'm able to enjoy those things so i think there's that aspect of it as well where it's it's just going to put us in this uh much much better uh just incentive structure around society when, when we get onto a bitcoin standard you guys are so young you guys are you are you at the same age both of you like i know you're 19 william right is 19 yeah i, I turned 19 three days ago it makes me somehow, to be honest, somehow hopeful or more even even more hopeful and optimistic. You know that young people like you guys. I mean, I'm, I'm what? How old am I? I'm 49. I think I'm 49 in February. <laughs> um, how old are you, Joe? I'm 22, so I've got William by a few years. Okay. <laughs> no, it's 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 really. I mean, I, it's it somehow makes me even more hopeful that more and more you know younger people are are totally like absorbing the whole you know, essence of Bitcoin and, and you, you guys are really a huge contribution to, to this space, you know, intellectually and, and, and transfer of knowledge and, and comprehension. So thank I want to thank think, you for that. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I, you know, I think one thing is our generation has, has been able to grasp it more than the older generations because the whole digital aspect of it, you know, this idea of digital scarcity and having a digital money, we've grown up with, with technology our whole lives. Like I had a little iPod touch when I was in first grade, right? Like, I've always had some kind of device in my hand and I've been connected to the internet since I was very young versus, you know, my parents, right? Like th that, that only came about when they were, you know, in their late thirties or early forties or whatever. Um, and, and so I think naturally our generation is, is uh, much more adapt to uh, grasp this idea of, of a digital money and, and this, this uh, internet native money. Um, Cause I think, you know, it freaks out, it freaks out my parents that it's like, Oh, you can't hold the money in your hand. You know what I mean? Like you, it's just, you just own the, the private keys and that's the way, you know what I mean? Like, it's just the, the concept, they're just thinking of it in their minds. It's, it's, it's hard for them because they haven't always grown up in, uh, in this technology native environment. So I think naturally that that kind of gives uh, our generation an advantage of, of thinking about that. And then as well, you know, we haven't always grown up in this, this fiat incentive structure and like, you know, I, I really started getting into finance around like like the end of March last year, right? And and so I didn't know anything about how our money works or any of that. Like, so so when I was when I was looking into this stuff, I'm like, okay, well, there's this this uh, you know digital economy that's going to be built around Bitcoin, and then there's this. Oh, well, this is obviously better, right? But it's hard for people that have lived in the fiat. Uh, world for for so long and they've had all these incentive structures that have really been deeply ingrained into them for for them to step out of that you know like independently think and take an outside look just you know think about it from first principles and say oh well i need to step out of this and step into this thing that's emerging it's hard for them to really think about like oh the the, the control is going to be taken away from the government like their whole lives they've always seen the government can do whatever they want they can bully anybody out of anything you know i think that's where like for you see a lot of the the government's going to ban bitcoin that's that's usually um you know all respect to people of your generation but it's usually people in their 40s right that you see coming out and saying that's usually the older people that make that argument and i think it's just because you have this incentive structure built where it's like the government's always just been able to do whatever they want yeah, and I would say even like over the past, you know, century, we've, we've only seen government get larger and larger and larger. And so it's, it's kind of hard to imagine smaller government. And I think we're, we are coming to a tipping point where government can get so large because they can create money and they can borrow at zero percent forever. But that's possibly about to change, it looks like. And it could be a really exciting time. And the manipulation has only ever been able to take place because we've never had an escape valve, right? Like, 
and now we do. So I think that's that's one key thing to touch on is just that all this manipulation through the money printing and buying through fixed income market, that's all taken place because there's never been any way to step out of this, right? Like in, in the German hyperinflation, a lot, a lot of merchants and stuff, like I read part of the book, uh, When Money Dies, I didn't read the whole thing, but in part of it, it talks about, you know, merchants would, would go on, on a US dollar standard instead of, instead of the, uh, the German mark. So they would, just, they would just step out of the German financial system and step into the, the US. But now what we have is this dynamic where every single currency is competitively uh, devaluing against each other. So there is no escape valve other than Bitcoin to step out of this. So I think that's where this is different. And one interesting uh, parallel from that book uh, that's kind of going on in today's society, I would say, is when when the hyperinflation was just beginning and asset prices, real estate, stocks in Weimar, Germany started to go up. At first, no one thought it was inflation. They, everyone thought they were getting rich. And I, I, I kind of see that happening today. What, whether it is Bitcoin, uh, like it is going up like very high, very significantly nominally, but stocks are, I mean, tech stocks are going crazy. You have like weird things happening with GameStop. There's just so much uh, just crazy stuff happening. Like home prices were up, um, I think like 18% year over year in the US. Just crazy, crazy stuff. And in different cities, obviously uh, that plays a role, but it's a really interesting time because some people think they're getting rich, but it's like, no, your house didn't go up 10%. It's the, the dollar is actually getting more worthless. <laughs> you see that TikTok video? It's like a couple and they're like, yeah, let me tell you about how we've been making money over the past. We buy the stock. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we buy the stock and then it goes up a little bit and then we sell and then we buy the next stock. Yep. It's like, I think, I think Preston said something about this in this, this, uh, this podcast he did with uh, Guy Swan, but he, it's like, you know, we're going to look back in 20, 30 years and be like, how, how is this not obvious to everybody what's going on? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I yeah. like the obvious symptoms that people, I mean, you know, it, it's some, someone who, you know, who stands still for a moment and thinks, you know, and for himself or herself, like, could aren't isn't that what Michael Saylor I think is trying to preach the whole time? You know, like we have like fifteen to twenty percent uh, yearly, like monetary inflation, uh, and you know he's talking about this digital, uh, you know, this hardest money, scarcest money, the di digital monetary network. I think this is what he's trying constantly to emphasize and, re and to repeat. And um, but somehow I don't know uh, with two percent uh, mass adoption globally. We're still so early. I have this feeling. Yeah, and I, I would even go as further. Uh, the guy, Croesus, who I talked about earlier, who wrote the article, The Yuppie Elite, he did, uh, obviously this was probably about a year ago now, but he did some research over where is Bitcoin adoption really at? Because yeah, you threw out the 2% the number, but I would, I would possibly argue it's less than that because if you really understand Bitcoin, you're not going to put 1% of your portfolio in Bitcoin. Uh, you're going to have a significant amount of Bitcoin. Uh, at least, you know, compared to, you know, your, your total portfolio of the assets that you hold. And so there, I think the, the amount of people that, that really understand that is, is very, very small. And I, and I think that that just presents a great opportunity and it, and it, for everybody. And it kind of proves that, you know, we're, you're not even close to being late to Bitcoin. I mean, this, this thing is, is really just getting started. So are we going to see this gradual, to, to use Parker Lewis uh, terminology, you know, uh, gradual and subtly process? Do, I mean, it's just intuitive thing, but do you think th this year is going to happen something crazy unexpectedly or just intuitively? You know, we don't have any facts or any evidence, nothing that hints at it. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, I would say like I, I'm like 50-50 on whether this is like, you know, like possible like hyper Bitcoinization or just like another uh, you know typical bull cycle, and then we'll follow with a bear cycle. Um, I, I think the one thing that's that's just different about this cycle compared to 2013, 2017 is the macro environment. I mean, the, the amount of money printing that's going on is just we we probably won't see like the the crazy 80 percent nominal decline that that we've seen in the past. So it it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out and. And as we approach, you know, the 2024 halving and, and people start to recognize, you know, 
Plan B's uh, stock to flow model or S2FX model. And, you know, I got that's been published in like uh, Wall Street Bank research reports. So like that stuff is, is really getting around. And, and I think people are kind of kidding themselves when, you know, we're, we're kind of following those models pretty closely. And, you know, at the after the next halving, uh, we basically see, you know, price of Bitcoin, of, you know, north of a million dollars. And then after that halving, the 2028, uh, we would see, a, you know, $10 million per Bitcoin. And so I think that for people to watch this cycle play out uh, like exactly as the model forecasted to, for, for people to just, you know, forget about it until 2024, I just don't see that happening. I, I think it's possible that people try to front run these halvings. But again, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out because we don't know the future, but uh, it's going to be exciting to watch. Yeah. What, you know why I'm asking? Because I was thinking could like the loss of, faith of trust you know in fiat become so sudden uh in let's just say you know starting in specific countries like hyperinflationary countries or you know in asia or wherever in india in venezuela iran turkey uh you know and that could like trigger a chain a cascade of, of you know of, of chain reaction you know like psychologically yeah i mean i, I certainly think that's possible. I mean, I, I know many Bitcoiners, including myself. I, I, don't, I don't care what price Bitcoin is trading at. I'm not selling a significant amount of my Bitcoin for dollars. I mean, that's just not going to happen. That would be crazy. And I mean, don't buy a Tesla. <laughs> I'm always advising yeah. people, don't buy a Tesla. Why, 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 do, why would you want to spend your Bitcoin for depreciating assets? <laughs> exactly. Teslas are cool, but I'm definitely not spending my Bitcoin on Tesla. Yeah. Uh, Other way for a yeah. spaceship. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll go to Mars instead. Okay. You know, I think there's going to be a lot of people that that uh, are going to try to time. They're going to they're going to watch the the dots on the stock to flow model. They're going to see that get up towards the top where you know usually we have a correction. They're going to try to sell, and then there's a good chance that it's going to keep running, <laughs> and then they're going to have to buy in it at twice what they sold. Um, so yeah, like Joe was saying, I I wouldn't take any chips off the table this time. Um, I think I think there's not a, not a majority chance that we go all the way this cycle, but I think there's a larger chance than in past cycles, obviously. And, and that would, it, it's a large enough chance that I'm not going to be taking that risk of trying to sell and then buy back lower. Uh, just because I think, you know, kind of what you touched on about the trust, like tr trust can evaporate very quickly. And, you know, it could be in a matter of months that, that trust is lost. Um, and so if that happens, you're going to have loss of trust while you have this thing like a rocket ship going up in the background, right? <laughs> and, and so I think that, that dynamic, it, it, could, it could be interesting. Um, but, you know, when you look at a lot of these on-chain indicators, um, which is what, like, I spend a lot of my time doing, I pretty much am just sitting on my computer, like, sifting through these different indicators and trying to... Yeah, you wrote an article, right? Was that a, your, your recent, your most recent article on the, what is it called? Um, let me see, what is it called? Um, something about the on-chain data. Oh, the from the it, one yesterday I had put out, it was just about... Uh, just the importance about of accurate on-chain data, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's another conversation. We can go down that route if you want. Um, but yeah, I, I put out like on-chain updates for uh, Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, I've been doing them almost like bi-weekly, but once I'm done with school, I'm going to start doing them weekly. But yeah, that's a whole nother, that's not, we can go down there if you want to start talking about that. But I was just going to say, you know, a lot of these indicators, they're, they're not nearly overheated. Like we have a lot of room to run. In my opinion, we're right around like three to 4k in 2017. And then 2013 is another, uh, another whole other animal. If you want to talk about that, because <laughs> if we're following 2013, we might go a lot higher, but uh, just to be conservative, I think we're right around the three to 4k range, just based off of different indicators on chain. Um, but that doesn't go to say that when they get overheated that I think we, we could uh, immediately see a correction. I think a lot of these indicators will get kind of, uh, I don't want to say destroyed, but they won't, they won't be, uh, they won't work the exact same as they have in the past, just because this, this cycle and the fundamentals around it um, are, are just uh, honestly just so different. That I think, I think the way that the cycle plays out and the players that we have in on this, on this cycle, it's just going to completely change the dynamic of some of these indicators. But granted, you know, they're, they're, human psychology doesn't change. Uh, so that's one thing to, to note. And then as well, you know, some of these funds, they have to trim their positions when they get to a certain size. Um, 
you know, let, let's say they take a, a 5% allocation to Bitcoin, Bitcoin doubles, then now they're at a 10% allocation, um, you know, if everything else is static. And so let's say they can't go over 10% allocation to a specific asset, you know, anything above that, that 10%, they're going to have to sell just because that's the, the regulatory framework around their fund. So I think we might see some of that for selling once we get up high enough. It's just a matter of, you know, when we see, when we see uh, bull markets, it's, it's not a matter of there's more, there's increased selling. It's just the fact that there aren't enough buyers to keep pushing the price up. So if, if we stop seeing enough buyers coming in, then that's going to be what, what causes the price to go down. Um, but, but yeah, I'm going to, you know, I, I kind of monitor it on a week to week basis. You know, it changes a lot. Um, and, and some of these, like the, the price prediction models, they, they're constantly changing. And, and uh, Willie Wu has one, one indicator that he created that I, that I love. And it, it, you know, it shows the, uh, the predicted uh, price for each cycle and you see, you know, this band um, just continues up, 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 up. And, and at the same time, the organic floor, it, it's something called NVT. So it, it, it uh, basically, you can think of it like a PE ratio measuring like the fair value of the network. And it, it basically takes the, uh, the uh, value of the transactions within the network and, and um, takes a ratio of that. And so, the natural price floor of Bitcoin, aka the fair value of, of uh, Bitcoin that's basically set by long-term holders, it keeps going up, 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 up. And right now we're around like 46,000 is around that floor. And then uh, we're also another really interesting thing that, that I'm looking at, um, I, I posted this yesterday, was we, we've had the largest amount of uh, capital inflow. So basically, um, this metric that, that Glassnode has measures um, the amount of new UTXOs, which are basically like new uh, wallet addresses or entities that, that come onto the network and how much capital is flowing into these UTXOs. And we're seeing the largest basically validation of, of, uh, of the current range of price that we're in. We're seeing the largest uh, validation since around like 10 to, 10 to 11,000. So you can think of that as like, we're building up this massive support zone uh, platform for, for price to grow up off of like, like the, the support zone that we're seeing now. Um, I don't know if we'll ever come back and break through this. Like, I, I think Willie posted something the other day, Willie Wu posted something about, um, you know, usually like two to three X above the previous all time high, we see this consolidation of, of capital inflows building up this massive support zone and you can think of it as like the point of no return which plan b is posted as well like if you look at his stock the flow model there's always one month where there's this huge gap and we never come back and fill that gap back down and so i think that's where we're kind of sitting at like everybody keeps telling me oh you keep talking about the coins moving off exchanges and all this crap like why isn't the price going up i think we're just in this massive consolidation right now where once once we break out of it i don't think you're ever going to see prices go back under give 40, 45,000 or anything like that. Um, and, and so it's very interesting because every time, granted, if we do come back down, like I don't think we'll come back down and, and break under uh, a trillion dollar market cap. And so it's interesting because every cycle you see this, this raised floor and it's basically like a network effect, you know, and, and every time you see this, the FOMO and the euphoria and everybody comes in, the speculators come in, but every time we come back down, the, the floor of adoption in the network and people that have said, oh yeah, th this thing's legit. I'm going to hold on to this thing. It grows, right? Like the people at the bottom of the bear that aren't selling, like they're people that really have conviction. And every time we go through these cycles, the, the bear floor is raising higher and higher and higher. So what, what that is really showing is that the, the network effect of, of Bitcoin is, is growing and it's just, you know, it's being measured in, in a, in dollars, you know, for the first time, we've never, we've seen network effects. We've never seen something with a monetary value attached to it. Um, but it's very interesting to see, you know, every cycle we continually build up that floor of adoption and, and users in the network. Would you put a number, would you put a number on the on the num you know on the on the people who are long term hodlers with conviction? Like, could you say, like, is it, is it millions of people or just a few millions or ten millions of people? Yeah, it's, you know, it's an interesting question because Glassnode has this, uh, it's a metric called entities. So they basically try to 
put together different uh, UTXO sets and try to separate them, separate them into different entities based off of like the movement of capital in the wallets, and these kinds of different things. Basically, I have like these super smart data scientists breaking up the, the different data. I'm sure uh, Raphael from Glasgow could give you a lot better explanation of how it works than I could. <laughs> um, but each each entity isn't necessarily one person. You know, it could be an institution or it could be a custody service or something like that. Then you also have, you know, uh, Coinbase, for example, they have uh, a cluster of wallets, which is serving hundreds of millions of people. So um, it, it you can guess, but it, to be honest, it's impossible to know exactly how many users there are on the network. Another thing that I think is really uh, different about this cycle compared to our previous ones uh, is two, two reasons. And sailors talked to this, about this as well. Uh, one is that miners no longer really have to sell uh, coins to cover their operating expenses. Like all the HUD-8, Marathon, Riot, these are all publicly traded miners in the U.S. And, and in Canada that are literally accumulating more Bitcoin than they're even mining because they have access to issue more equity or raise more debt. Number two, though, is hold, big holders don't have to sell. Uh, whether you like BlockFi or, or lending type programs like that or not, uh, it's an opportunity for people to retain ownership of the Bitcoin that they have and, and, and to earn some yield off of it. In addition, like we talked about that uh, contango trade uh, where you could take it a step further. And if you have, you know, X amount of Bitcoin, you could borrow, uh, you know, a certain amount of dollars with it, use those dollars to buy Bitcoin, execute the contango trade, which is relatively risk free. And if you're borrowing the dollars that say from Unchained Capital at maybe 10%, you're earning the 25% uh, annual yield. You're just capturing a 15.15% a 15 .15 spread that uh, that you can easily capture. And, and if you have a significant amount of coins or not even a significant, some coins, you could live off that 15% without having to sell your coins and retaining all of the Bitcoin that you have. And so I think like the, like the dynamics between uh, like people that, sold in the past, uh, they, they may not be selling again in the future. And we're already seeing these miners uh, not selling this, this this time around. Yeah, Joe's not kidding. You know, we there's a metric called, uh, it basically shows miner net position, right? So you saw miners really started ramping up selling right around like 27,000 to 32,000. And that was when they really, they really dumped all the coins I think that they were going to sell for the time being. But, but since 32,000, I mean, they pretty much just completely, like they had their foot on the gas and they completely let it off. Now they're not selling anything. And this indicator is actually the last couple of days flipped green, <laughs> which means they're not only not selling, but like Joe's saying, they, they're actually buying Bitcoins, which is incredible to see. And then the other thing as well, he's talking about, you know, long-term holders not selling. You can see that on chain as well. Um, it was the same thing. They started really ramping up selling around like 27,000 to 32,000. But since then, they really stopped. So... Uh, I think both of those, both entities are the long-term holders and the miners. Uh, they're expecting higher prices and that in, in combination with what Joe's saying, you know, I, I think that's where the cycle is really different is uh, like Joe was saying, we don't, they don't have to sell. Right. And I think that's reflected by the coins moving off exchanges. Um, there's, there's a couple different dynamics there, but that, that's that's one of the big things is, is they don't have to sell. Like miners don't have to sell Bitcoins to cover their their, uh, their operations like they have in the past. Um, and so we'll see how that plays out with the dynamic as far as the, the supply and, and demand goes. Yeah, and just a short comment I, I have about this lending uh, uh, issue is that I heard, I think Preston Pichy was talking about like, you know, the, the, the market has to mature and, he wouldn't like give away his Bitcoin unless, you know, they would pay him like 40 to 50% return. Because, you know, if you have like an average on average, like 200% return every year, uh, why would you want to give or risk, uh, you know, giving away your Bitcoin in whatever shape or form, you know, uh, lock it in or, but it's still, you, you're still risking. Um, I'm not sure whether the market still is already mature enough. What, what do you think about this whole lending uh, business and borrowing? It's very interesting because it, it like BlockFi, I believe their their AUM is is in the billions now, which is, which is obviously significant for anything Bitcoin related. Um, but as far as far as like, would you want to do like that lend out your Bitcoin to get more yield? But you could also just uh, like use something like Unchained Capital, where you deposit your Bitcoin, simply borrow it, 
and then borrow USD with it. And then you could use that USD to live, you know, however you like. And, and if Bitcoin's going up 200% a year and you're paying 9% interest, well, you're capturing a massive spread there as long as Bitcoin keeps going up like we think it will. And so that is a that is another way that I think is a great way to like live off your Bitcoin as long as like you're borrowing significantly less than what Bitcoin's worth to, to be conservative. Um, but yeah, as, as far as the, like the, the lending platforms that are out there, I, I don't really know. I, I think long-term uh, that is probably not very sustainable because I think under a Bitcoin standard, there just won't be much debt. It'll be more equity-based. And so I, I, I would exer- like tell people to like exercise caution uh, when dealing with platforms like that. Um, but I, again, I don't know. I mean, I, I know like the, the, the GBTC trade that a lot of uh, funds were doing uh, where you basically borrow Bitcoin and then uh, uh, exchange it for GBTC. And then hopefully GBTC is trading at a premium in six months, you'd sell that at, at the premium and then you'd capture the, the risk, basically risk-free spread. But as we've seen, GBTC is now trading uh, at a discount. So that trade's kind of gone. Um, and I, I I, I, I've heard Zach Prince, who's the CEO and founder of BlockFi, he, he mentioned that that was only 20% of uh, of you know the Bitcoin that they've lent, that they've lent out to the different funds that were performing uh, trades like that. Um, so so there's other ways that they are generating the yield, whether it's you know market making arbitrage from exchange to exchange, um, especially when Bitcoin gets volatile. That there's a lot of money to be made in that. Um, but again, I, I, I definitely would not put all of my coins, uh, with any sort of lending platform. Hey, this was an amazing conversation before we wrap up. Well, let me ask you, are there any th- like things that are going on developing that really makes you excited with a, you know, I'm thinking like Jack Mahler's, this is really amazing that he's, he's the, the, you know, what he has developed or, you know, what he has worked out this instantaneous payment service, uh, and uh, via lightning, is there is there anything that makes you really excited at the moment? I would say there's a, there's a DLCs in general, uh, discrete log contracts uh, make me pretty excited. There's this new platform called Atomic Finance, which is a way for you know people to generate yield uh, off their Bitcoin, but they're doing it in a, in a unique way using discrete log contracts. So basically what you would do is you're selling a call option. So if Bitcoin price, if the Bitcoin price rises uh, significantly, uh, you might not get all of your Bitcoin, but if it, if it doesn't, uh, same, you know, goes up a little bit or remains relatively flat, you get to earn a yield off your Bitcoin, which is really exciting. And you can do it in a pretty trustless manner. So, so Atomic Finance is a, is a great product uh, that, I, that I'm looking forward to using in the future. William. Is there anything? What excites you? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I don't, I don't really have a really good answer. I would just say you know the, the maturation of different parts of the uh, the infrastructure built around the network. I think, for example, we were talking about lending. Um, you know, I'd be willing to lend out some of my Bitcoin once we have multiple uh, like peer to peer providers, right? And, um, I wouldn't just trust one. Maybe I take a couple percent of my stack and I spread it across 10 different lending platforms. And that way my risk is, is spread out across all those different platforms. So I think once more of those uh, come online, then I'd be more willing to do something like that. And then as well, um, when more for me, uh, you know, cause like I'm, I'm more into like all this on-chain data crap. Um, I, I'm interested for more, di- for more data providers to come out um, because, you know, we really only have like two or three main ones. Um, and so when you have when you have more data providers, you can kind of cross reference them, right? Um, for example, like I'm using Glassnode, which I, I think they're they're the best in the business. Them in, them in coin metrics. But you know, at the end of the day, I am I am relying on them. You know, if their data is bad, then I'm putting out bad information. So for me, um, seeing seeing more data providers come online and then being able to cross reference those, I think that's very important. Um, and then also to kind of keep check on, on, on each other and, uh, and make sure the most accurate information uh, possible is coming out. Because, you know, at, I think it'll become more important as we see uh, hybrid Bitcoinization take place because for the first time, we're able to completely track all the capital inflow through uh, this, this new digital economy that, that we all think is going to become more relevant in the coming years. So I think it's going to be a, a space that is a space that really excites me. So yeah, just see, you're seeing more data providers come online and uh, 
being able to get more accurate data. I think that that's important to me. Hey, you both, you know, really are doing what should I call it? God's work. So, <laughs> so thanks so much again for your time. And, you know, it was really, uh, really awesome, this talk. So I'm going to put all your uh, links. Is there anything, are there any links, any articles coming up? I'm going to put up. All- I would say check out Joe's new article on, on Contango. If you're interested in that, uh, he really did a good job about breaking that down into to different pieces. Um, you know, I think anybody who, who doesn't have a firm understanding of, of finance, they can get their head wrapped around it because I think it's been something that a lot of people have been confused about and it's been kind of made into a meme on Twitter because people don't really understand it. But uh, yeah, Joe did a great job uh, of breaking it down in that article. So definitely check that out. Definitely. Yeah, I would say I would say also just follow uh, Bitcoin Magazine. I think William and I are both posting our stuff now there. I'm posting mine under Mimesis Capital. You can check out our website too, mimesiscapital.com, and see all of our research. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I appreciate you having us on, and I definitely enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, I mean, if I have any, you know, if we have missed out any any points, any questions we should have covered, uh, just you know, we can uh, wrap it up maybe. Is there anything I forgot or something that should be should be mentioned or uh, maybe discussed? Um, oh, I think I'm all good. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I have any more. Beautiful. Okay, guys, thank you so much again, and hope we can repeat this sometime in the future. Keep up the great work. <laughs> sure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Appreciate it. Bye, Joe. Bye, William. All right. Really enjoyed this talk. These. I mean, they're so young and so, you know, dynamic, so so knowledgeable, and they're doing really, I mean, fundamental work um, for, you know, education, for um, uh, transferring this knowledge to even noobs, you know, whether you're a Bitcoin beginner, advanced user, or, uh, or uh, you know, or with, from whatever angle you're coming from. So make sure you follow them, William and Joe Burnett and uh, William Clement III, and Follow them on Twitter, follow them on Bitcoin Magazine. I'm going to put up all the uh, articles in the show notes. And make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel, my podcast platform. Thank you so much again for listening. And uh, let me know if you have any questions, suggestions for any uh, future panel discussions. And I'll see you soon again. I'm the host of the Kevin Devani Connection. And have a great day. Bye.